Well, good morning. How's things? I already ate one of those salsas. Down to one, so I gotta, I gotta be more judicious about it. So put that in. Here. Can't be salsa. The Lord be with you. Thank you. We pray. Lord, keep us steadfast in Your Word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would wrest the kingdom from Your Son and bring to naught all He has done. Amen. All right, I thought this week we would study the Bible instead of me just complaining about things like dogs and <laughs> other things. But in my defense, I had just come back from vacation, and I really hadn't looked at anything. So This week, however, is different, and I want to go to Genesis chapter 18. There it is. You're actually going to hear from... Dr. Luther today as well. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Okay, Genesis 18. <clears throat> Genesis is written so uh, primitively sometimes that uh, it, it's difficult for us to really kind of capture the uh, emotional sense of what's happening in these stories. Uh, take, for example, par excellence, the story of Abraham nearly sacrificing Isaac. The way it reads, like to our modern eyes, it's like, and then he went up here and went, the Lord will provide, and then took the knife. And was like, ready? Like, probably was not so austere. It was probably pretty emotional, and Isaac probably wasn't like, oh, yes, Father, please stab me and burn me, you know, as an offering to the Lord, right? So those details, though, are, like, eerily absent from the book of Genesis. So, like, there's no, like, it's, ooh. Like, the most emotion you get is Joseph weeping for his brothers, which should tell us something about like the rest of the story. Now that now, see, I'm already rambling. Um, the all of these stories with like the those types of details left out of them. What is the point of Joseph and his tears? Why is he weeping? The purpose of that whole story: his brothers coming here, coming there. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And so he does what to them? He forgives them. So. First time you see real emotions explicitly named in Scripture is Genesis 6 6, where God grieved that he had even made the creation, it floods it by holy baptism. And then you look at Joseph weeping. So, you know, he can't hold it together. He's got to leave his brother's presence when they don't know that it's him yet and just weep bitterly. And, you, and then that leads to the forgiveness. So, I don't know. There's something there. I haven't dug into that yet, but I think that there's something there. <clears throat> At any rate, chapter Genesis chapter 18, the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran to the tent door and meet them and bowed himself to the earth. And said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. So in that type of culture, uh, hospitality is like the cardinal virtue. So much so that uh, <laughs> so much so that in chapter 19, um, the, the guy, like the, the wicked men of Sodom came to Lot's house. Right? Remember that? Uh, to like take his guests and sodomize them. And he says, oh, I've got two daughters instead. But, you know, the theory is because they're homosexual, they're like, yuck, girls. And then, uh, I don't know, that's one leading theory. Um, at any rate, like, that always really bothered me. Like, boy, some father you are. Or, no, no, maybe he knew that they wouldn't take his girl. I'm like, that doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, and then there's another theory, too, and this is kind of a ramble that uh, I don't believe this, but... Um, that that whole lot story with his daughters got him drunk and slept with him and they both got pregnant from their father was like anti 
whatever, whatever tribe it was, <laughs> was like uh, propaganda against him, against his offspring, that somehow made it into the Bible. I'm like, give me a break. All right. So anyway, we've already turned this into like an R-rated Bible study. I'm talking about all this stuff. But hello, welcome to the book of Genesis. We don't need to talk about Onan. Uh, verse 4, let a little water be brought. Wash your feet, rest yourselves under the tree, whilst I bring a morsel of bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. Abraham went in quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seeds of high flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, took a calf, tender and good, gave it to a young man, prepared it quickly. Then he took curds, milk, and the calf that he prepared, set it before them. Sounds like a good meal. And he sat by them under the tree while they ate. So you have this image of this type of hospitality that's just like, hey, you're a traveler, hey, you're whatever, like this is the cardinal virtue. So how does that inform the story, the corresponding story in the lectionary of Jesus talking about the persistent neighbor who knocks on the door in the middle of the night? Remember that? Uh, which one of you will knock on the door uh, because guests have arrived at my house. So please, dear neighbor, give me, give me three dinner rolls. That's what it kind, of, kind of what it says. Give me three dinner rolls so that I can like, feed them with it. It was sort of like a traveling food. Because of your persistence and not because you're there. Yeah, it's a little different lesson. But does that inform that? Does that inform that little parable? Hospitality is so important that it emphasizes the absurdity of Jesus' parable. Like, of course you would. It's like, you know, I, I could not really think of a good uh, equivalent. Uh, the, the closest I got and then I decided not to in the sermon was, sermon was like, let's say your neighbor knocks on your door in the middle of the night and he's got like a gash, he's bleeding from the face. And I've got an emergency, do you have any gauze, maybe even a Band-Aid or something? And you say, go away. You know, only a psychopath would do that. So that's kind of the closest I came. But it may have been, I don't know, you know probably that serious. Like, the, yeah, it's an emergency. It's the middle of the night, I cannot, there's so much shame involved and that, because we're 21st century Americans, we don't understand what shame is. <laughs> Just recently I thought, oh, last night I was talking to a friend of mine and who, uh, he told me some story, I won't get into it. Uh, but I said, well, did he at least have the decency to be ashamed of himself? <laughs> I thought that was a fun phrase to say. And he said, I think so. I'm like, well, that means no. If you think so, that means no. Have you no shame? That's what we need. We need shame. We need shame back. Especially amongst these fornicators, young people. All right. Um, verse, eight, verse 5. Verse 6. Abraham, uh, verse 7. <laughs> where am I? Verse 9. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So they know, they know her. So these are beginning to tip their hands, as it were, that they're godly messengers. He said, she's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. What just happened there? What do you make of that? There are these three guys, and then the Lord said. Yeah, there's some prophecy, right? Okay, so there's that verse, uh, do good to all in, in Hebrews, for by so doing you might entertain angels. They're referring specifically to this. Entertaining angels, I used to think when I was young, was like, angels are watching and they're like, ah, that's, that's funny. I'm entertained by how goofy you are. You know, like, that's not what it means. Entertaining is like, I, I will be your hospitable to you, right? That type of entertainment. You are, you are my guest. Be our guest. And sit down. We bring to you your dinner. And, <clears throat> um, that's what that means. So the three messengers, well, we got to keep going so we can circle. We'll circle back around to that. Verse 9, put, a, put your finger down there. Verse 10. 
uh, Sarah was listening uh, at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. <laughs> the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah, which is like the politest way possible of saying she's gone through menopause. The way of women. So, <laughs> I, <just, laughs> I got to stop right there. So Sarah laughed. I was going to make a joke. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? So her idea of shall I have pleasure is, shall I have the pleasure, the honor of having a child? Because she's been barren up to this point. And she's old, and, she, and now she's past menopause. So totally out of her head that um, it's even possible. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you in about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. <laughs> what a weird paragraph. But why did she laugh? I guess I'll name him Isaac, which means laughter. Ha! Can you believe it? <clears throat> then the men set out from there, and they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. Now, here's a crucial part that we can link to verse 10 there. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteous and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised to him. What has he promised to Abraham? Yes, a son. That is his promise. So on the one hand, you've got the law, and on the other hand, you've got the gospel. And according to Abraham, there is the promise. Um, I'm just going to put the Jesus symbol on there. And on the other side, which we'll get to shortly, we have... Sodom and Gomorrah. We've got this lovely juxtaposition of law and gospel. We've got the law burning hellfire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah, and you've got the gospel being promised to Abraham. Now, the fact that the Lord says, shall I hide from Abraham? No, I won't. I'm not going to hide this proclamation of judgment from the one to whom I'm giving the proclamation of life and salvation. So what does that tell you about the way we proclaim the word of God even today? Yes. You can't have one without the other. Law and gospel, law and gospel. If I just tell you, this is why it, so many evangelism kind of happy-ish evangelism modules flop, because um, if I just go around telling people Jesus loves you, and, that, and they're not convicted of any sort of sin or wrongdoing, why would they care? What do you need Jesus for? What do you need Jesus for? Not a trick question. Yeah, to forgive me my sins, give me life and salvation. Right? Uh, not necessarily, though these come naturally, to give me all fuzzy feelings and, uh, and, and make me want to go and join a church and get free coffee on Sundays. Like what? That's right. So instead, to the, and this is, you know, Walther's magnum opus of the proper distinction between law and gospel is the word of God is rightly divided into law and gospel. The law does what? Condemn. We say it's got three functions, curb, mirror, and guide. Some would only limit that to two, curb and mirror, because lex semper accusat. The law always condemns. And I use Latin because Vicar was complaining this week about a piece of, that he had to read, and it kept saying corum Deo, which means before God. And he's like, come on. And I'm like, I'm trying to like, all right, settle down here. And then uh, you know, I just wrote a paragraph today that includes the phrase sine qua non. So I'm like, hey, people who write stuff like this. They've got to be pedantic and pretentious and all this stuff. So, lex semper accusat is your Latin phrase for the day. It means law always condemns. So, you've got the word of God divided rightly in the law, which is proclaimed to unrepentant sinners. 
the second there's a modicum of a turn toward remorse, contrition, then what happens? A deluge of gospel goes on top of that, right? So in this way, it's not, you shouldn't think of it like a 50-50 kind of thing. The gospel predominates in its sweetness. And if you don't have the proclamation of the law, then you don't know what you're being saved from. Right? So this idea that we're in the new creation, the former things have, have passed away, that doesn't mean that we don't know or don't remember what Jesus saved us from. Because in that contrast is all the glory, power, and might to God. He still has the, the wounds, the mortal wounds, now the immortal wounds that saved us. So it's not like we're going to be walking around and we don't remember anything bad that happened here on earth in these earthly bodies. And we're like, Jesus, where'd you get that scar? What? Are you kidding me? That's the whole point. The whole point, giving glory to God in that way. So we just, we won't remember the former things with the trauma attached to them. We will rather remember them as things like, Boy, remember when we were peering through a glass dimly? Remember when we didn't understand? Remember when we were caught in our trespasses and our sins? Remember when we were still suffering and struggling? We, I think we suffered more than we actually cared to admit or realize. We had no idea because no ear has heard and no eye has seen what God has prepared for us. And now here we are, the new creation, and everything is brilliant and perfect. And we sing praises to the Lamb who was slain whose blood sets us free to be his people. And we remember this. We will remember it. God will take your weakness, your thorns, and make it to his glory because his grace is sufficient for you. Therefore, we rejoice. Okay? So, proper distinction between the law and gospel. Shall I hide from Abraham? By no means. I've chosen him that he may command his children and his household. So here you kind of have like law, gospel, law again. You've got Abraham, your, <clears throat> your promise is going to be fulfilled in the Messiah. Uh, this is what happens, Sodom and Gomorrah, to the wicked. And now you, in your righteousness, through your offspring, you will proclaim to your generation, hey, don't do that that Sodom and Gomorrah did. Right? The axiom is not true. What happens in Las Vegas will be spread all over the company of heaven. Look at this guy. Okay, now, let's talk about these three blokes. Who are they? They're angels. So why does it all of a sudden shift to saying, the Lord said? Yeah, what do you think? Take a, take a stab at it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the Lord is speaking through them, you're saying? That's exactly right. That was really quick. I'm going to read. I just came across this gem almost by accident this week. This is Martin Luther's lectures on Genesis 18. Uh, oh, wait. Um, third angel remained. Him, like the other two, Abraham regarded as a human being, but as such as one in whom was the Spirit of God. For he saw that this angel had the Word of God, and he concluded that this angel was speaking the Word of God, not that of a human being. For this reason, Abraham also worshipped him as God. Therefore, the t statement of the text said, he stood still before the Lord. And that was, we didn't get that far yet, but that, it keeps going. Uh, is the same as if it stated, Abraham listened to and looked upon this third angel as upon God because he knew that this angel had the word of God. These words have reference to the high office of the ministry. Howard? Uh, not necessarily, yeah. The question was, whenever the name, angels' names are not mentioned, it's God. There is the Malach Yahweh in Hebrew, the servant of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, I should say. And that traditionally has been understood as like pre-incarnate Christ, right? But just because it's an angel doesn't necessarily 
mean that, uh, that it is the Malik Yahweh. It's all shrouded in mystery, of course, because it's angelology and, like, who knows. Uh, besides the fact that the Pentateuch, has, you've got Jacob's ladder, angels ascending and descending. You've got these three angels slash men. What are they? Uh, so few appearances of angels in that proper sense that the Sadducees could have the Pentateuch as their holy scripture and also deny the existence of angels, which we know they do from the book of Acts. So, good question. Um, Luther continues, We who have the light at its brightest even add insults, yes, also the sword and hunger. In this way we kill off the ministers of the gospel. Now let us hear Abraham's prayer, which is indeed an awful one, if you consider the outcome. Awful, he doesn't mean this is a, like he messed up or something. It means awful, like it's terrible and heartbreaking, heart-wrenching prayer. Um, um, yeah, it's horrible that not ten righteous men are found in these five cities. Here we are seeing, this is kind of weird. This is just kind of Luther being quirky. Here we are saying nothing about the children. They are being preserved in a manner which is unknown to us, as is proved by the passage in Jonah about those who do not know the difference between the right and the left, Jonah 4.11. But the adults were all corrupt. I was like, what? Did he just pull a Baptist move? Like, all the babies are okay. All the children are fine. You know, whatever. But on the other hand, I think he's right. And I think the whole point in... Uh, Abraham's prayer is the juxtaposition between the righteous and the unrighteous. God will not sweep away the righteous with the unrighteous. Now, dear Lutheran, what do you say about people being righteous? There is no one righteous, no, not one. That's in the Bible. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are freely being justified by his grace as a gift. Who is righteous? Okay, ah, yeah, you skip through the cross, yeah. We put on righteousness through Jesus. But before that, before we are clothed with his righteousness and holy baptism, we are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own, as the baptismal rite goes. So it's his righteousness that then is imputed to us, uh, to use that metaphor. So he's the righteous one. So you really have this nice topological move between Abraham praying for Sodom and Gomorrah fervently, passionately, awfully, and Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Abraham is praying, can you spare the righteous? Jesus is saying, can you spare the wicked? So in Abraham's day, no one is spared because no one is righteous. And for Jesus' prayer, all the unrighteous are spared in place of one righteous, himself. Isn't that beautiful? Just, you have the law and gospel in, that whole, in both of those stories. And you have this really awful thing. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about kind of a level three reading here. Uh, which is all like the details of the story and stuff. Skip back real quick to uh, verse uh, chapter 14. <clears throat> Mary, do you need a Bible? Okay. I got a... See, see but this is what I told you. Yeah, I didn't use one for two weeks. I just went, I got a Hebrew one here if you want. <laughs> yeah, all I did was complain about people and their dogs. And what was I talking about last week? Okay, chapter 14. There's like buzz stuck to me. <laughs> In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Ariok, king of Elasar. Sounds like Lord of the Rings, doesn't it? Shedor Leomar, kings of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim. These kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and these kings of Bela, that is Zoar, and all these joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is 
the salt sea, the Dead Sea. 12 years they had served that guy, but in the 13th year they rebelled. In the 14th year that guy and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim at Ashtoreth Karnim and Zuzim and Ham and Emim and Shavakiriathim. And the Horites, maybe this is why we forgot this part of the story. And the Horites in their hill country of Seir as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazan Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Edmah, the king of Zeboim, the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim, that is like right, the Dead Sea right there, with uh, that guy, king of Elam, Tidal, king of a bunch of, okay, fine, four kings against five. Some battle, huh? Now, verse 10. Now, the Valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits, tar pits. And as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abraham's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and went their way. Then one who had escaped came and told Abraham the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkol and Aner, though these were allies of Abraham. When Abraham heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Uh, that just, okay, when I see like four armies against five armies, you picture thousands and thousands of people. Probably not. You know how small this area is? He just named like nine kingdoms, right? So it, it's sort of like, okay, and then the princedom of the Helmreichs rose up against the kingdom of the Upholds. You know, there's not that many of them. <laughs> just like down the road, you know, a handful of people. So obviously, because Abraham is able to, to do this with 318 men. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah north of Damascus. That is a long way away. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. After his return from defeat of Kedolamar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him at the valley of Shabbat, that is, King's Valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. Salem is where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Uh, he was priest of God Most High. He blessed them and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your hands into your hands. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is mentioned in the book of Hebrew if you want to more about that. Abraham gave him a tenth of everything, also called a tithe. I was, also, I was, also, I was talking to my friend last night on the phone. He's a pastor. He's talking about some, some other church he was hearing about that is just, uh, just making some bad choices and uh, is losing people like, like mad. And... Uh, can't afford, right? And this was a rant that I've had here. There's no such thing as can't afford. There's won't afford or don't want to afford. You can afford everything. Uh, and I said, how many, how many uh, family units does it take to support a full-time pastor adequately? 10, obviously, right? It's just math. If everybody's tithing, everybody makes a decent living. Tithe, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Okay, here's one. So for every 10 families, you get one pastor. <laughs> I would probably be bored. Like there's a sweet spot, you know, 10 is probably a little too few. <clears throat> this guy again. <laughs> uh, the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. Well, that was really generous of this Sodomite. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, He's mimicking the prayer of Melchizedek, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abraham rich. 
I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. So Abraham is like in payment and recompense for his saving them. He takes what in response? Nothing. In fact, he gives to the high priest a tenth of everything. This man is righteous. This is not, like this is, so imagine now that application of that metaphor, if you want to kind of allegorize that situation here, which actually did happen, but okay. Jesus hears that you're taken captive, and so he goes and he redeems you. And when you want to repay him, he's like, I don't need anything. That'll preach too, wouldn't it? Verse 15, Abraham, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Okay, now we skip back to chapter 18. Flip back. Uh, how many years have passed? Okay, so right after he rescues Lot, yeah, right after he rescues Lot, has this whole experience with the Sodomites, right? I mean, the people living in Sodom, I know that, but I'm deliberately using the word because I want to emphasize how wicked these people were. I almost, I toyed with the idea of in the sermon saying to save all of you sodomites, but I thought, no, that's a little too far. That's a little too much. <laughs> um, <laughs> he gets the promise from God in chapter 15, right? The promise of, to be a great nation. And then the next chapter, um, Sarah gets impatient and he has Ishmael. And then but when Isaac is born, uh, Ishmael's like 14 years old. So now imagine that. Does this put things into perspective in what Abraham is praying for and who he's praying about? He literally risked his life and his men's lives and, uh, to rescue the Sodomites from these, this foreign king and brought them back, and rescued Lot. And so Lot lives in Sodom. Lot lives with these people. Abraham knows them. Abraham loves them. Abraham, you know, wants them to turn. But still, so wicked is their, so great is their wickedness that God will not spare them. So that adds a whole dose of emotion to that prayer, which is why Luther, which Luther calls an awful prayer. And how you can imagine now the connection between Abraham's prayer and Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane is that much more powerful because we know that Jesus sweat like drops of blood, right? It was probably the same for Abraham as he interceded for them. Knowing the character of God that the wicked cannot stand, but the righteous will not be swept away. Except for the one righteous who's, who gives himself as a ransom for many. Um, Okay, so we talked about the three men. We talked about the connection to Sodom that Abraham has. Here's another thing that, that Luther says. This is really, I find it interesting. Let's see if I can find it quickly. Two other points. Um, he mentions all of the pra patriarchs that were still around People of Sodom are like crags and very hard rocks. Uh, I don't think I can find it. But in here, he mentions all of the patriarchs that are still alive. Just doing simple math, at this time, Noah has only been dead for like 80 years. <laughs> uh, Shem is living in Jerusalem, like this is what Luther says, like he knows how you've got like our facts add, like oh, kind of the lineage, if you look in, in a previous chapter in Genesis of all these people up to Abraham and how old they were when they died, you can just do the math and know that they're kind of in the area. And so he connects that, Luther, you know, it's kind of a stretch, but it's Luther, so he does whatever he darn well wants to. Um, that, you know, these tremendous patriarchs, Shem and Jerusalem, 
Abraham and Mamre and this other guy somewhere else, and then a couple others where we don't know where, they were the righteous people. They were, Luther calls them the church, proclaiming uh, repentance to the sodomites. Please stop sinning, turn, go, no. And this is consistent with, you know, the great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews. You know, Noah was a patient man who waited uh, and proclaimed and surely was mocked and ridiculed for his proclamation over the course of a hundred years that it was going to rain. And they're all like, no, no such thing as rain. <clears throat> so anyway, this, all this to read you this, which is really poignant, I think, for our day today. It is terrible that in this golden age, yeah, 1529, yeah, real, you didn't even have toilet paper, man. In this golden age, when so many patriarchs were living and teaching, I think success in life is judged by how good the toilet paper is. Like, <laughs> contentment in civilization, that is like the golden mark of civilization is the quality of toilet paper. It's the little things. That's no little thing, Julia. <laughs> would have never made it as a I never would have made it as a pioneer. Of course, my diet would have been different, I guess. So many patriarchs were living and teaching when Shem himself was upholding the ministry of the word in the temple at Jerusalem. The people of Sodom de degenerated to such an extent and abandoned all fear and knowledge of God. In 14 years. Well, we didn't know what they were like before that, but just think of that time. That's just amazing. Why then are we complaining about our own age when this has happened to so many and to so distinguished patriarchs? <laughs> this is Luther. I love this part. So much that I marked it and, and said I got to bring this to you guys on Sunday. Therefore, let us put up with these dregs of the world and with such extraordinary ingratitude and contempt. For we are not worthy of being compared to the saintly patriarchs. Yet they too were compelled to see so awful and hideous an example of the wrath of God, and their persistent prayers had no effect whatever. There's a paradox for you. Should we pray for the baby killers and the sodomites? Of course we should. What should we pray for them about? That they would repent and know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, that they repent. Yes, you still have time. There's still time that we repent. Oh, dear Lord, make them to be your righteous children. Turn them to be your righteous children. Uh, for they are, they are caught in the devil's lies, and they're surrounded by people who are of unclean lips, who are also telling them lies, whose father is also the devil. And it's just lies, lies, and more lies. Lies, lies, and damn lies. How did, who said that? Lies, more lies, and statistics. Yeah, who was that? It was some, anyway, Strom Thurmond or somebody. I don't remember. Wait, you were going to say something? Well, yeah, you heard that back in the day. Yeah. That they were looked at like they were the remnant. The person that they can know the people. Yeah, the remnant, yeah. The comment was he wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, the comment was a very good point. The comment was that God would not um, sweep away the righteous. Yes, but in like Babylon, yeah, they're the innocent are caught up. And you've also got words of Jesus saying like, do you think you're a worse sinner than that person? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, something worse will happen to you, you know, that kind of thing. So there's this is like leveling out. Here's my answer to that, uh, and I'm pretty sure this is true. There's a difference between uh, righteous suffering in this world because it's a fallen sinful place and righteous eternal judgment of God. I think Sodom and Gomorrah is the par excellence example of hell, the, like the punishment of hell. Hence why I said it in the sermon, there are no innocent bystanders in hell. So that specific type of punishment, because a righteous person getting caught in the fray, you know, if you're in a, you're in a car accident on the highway or whatever and you die, you're not being punished, right? You could be a righteous person before God, which you are, caught up in 
the, the unfortunate circumstances of living in a fallen world, right? That is not eternal judgment, because you are, have eternal life, it can't be taken away from you, right? Which makes it even more powerful when Jesus says, woe to you, Chorazin, and woe to you, Bethsaida, if the works done in you were done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in dust and ashes. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? How do you get less bearable? Sodom and Gomorrah is the example of hell. It's fire and brimstone, for crying out loud. There's already tar pits there, and it's just like, boom, it's gone. It's just ashes, cinders. Uh, but they didn't have the full revelation of the kingdom of God in the flesh of Jesus Christ. So woe to you, Bethsaida, woe to you, Chorazin. Oh, Lord, you made it so hard to believe. No, I didn't. No, he didn't. Uh, okay, so the paradox, we pray for those people, specifically that they not, I think it's, it's important to pray too that they not be harmed, right? So people who have aberrant lifestyles, people who live unnatural lifestyles, people who believe wicked things, people who support agendas like abortion, they should be, their, they, we should pray for their physical protection. I think it's very important. We should pray that no violence come upon any humanity for the sake of their belief. Caveat, if you've like harmed a child or murdered somebody or what, you know, like fill in the blank of like capital crimes or whatever, yeah, you should be, I think in philosophy, the death penalty is not objectionable to a Christian. I only object to it socially because I think the way we do it is ridiculous. Like, you know, rope is cheap. And they, yeah, Howard? Like, pray for just extreme guidance. Extreme, gu extreme guidance, yes. And again, like Valerie said, that they repent and, and come to know the gospel. Okay, so there's the, par there's the one side of the paradox. At the same time, what's the other side of that kind of realization? You know, like what Luther said here. So many people better than us great patriarchs of old who were buddies with Noah and his son, who was actually on the ark. Can you imagine that? You come off this guy. This guy's still alive. Shem is still alive. He's like, you know, back in my day, there were only eight of us. <laughs> and now there's a bunch of people knocking on Lot's door saying, hey, bring your guests out so that we can have sex with them. What happened? <laughs> yeah, Karen. Mm -hmm. And then Kurt just said, Lot, God came to Sodom to kill Lot, and he actually went and told his son, son from God, let's hurry, get out of this place, because it's about to be destroyed. So here's a list. If you read the list, it says 15, um, the coming of the dawn, the anger of old Lot from her. Yes, yes. Grabbed him. And the angels of his wife and two daughters and led them safely out of the city. And it says why there in verse 16, the Lord being merciful. Exactly. That's that's right. That's yes. the answer because yes. they were afraid for themselves. Wonderful. But they answered Believe. Yeah. to the prayers that had been prayed I love it. earlier. And even what happens after that. Yeah. Wait, Lot? I don't think it was sodomy, but yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Used to and for his glory. And sometimes he's got to grab us by the hand and force us out of our wicked situation. Because we can't do it. Yeah. Angels. Angels. Yeah. When we think we have to have the strength, we don't have the strength. 
you don't have anything. Yeah. <laughs> That's like the idea, hey, Lord, I would like this prayer. Would you like these bits of string in response? Get this out of my face. You don't have anything. Uh, even to that extent, you're like, Lord, I will give you my heart. I don't want that. I want all of it. I'm just going to take it. He does want it, but us offering it is not a gesture that's going to lead to anything. He just does it, you know. Uh, as one author wrote, uh, the, you know, the Lord is like a, an old man with a cane who sees your heart as a tin can on the side of the road, a piece of garbage to be tossed away. But he, instead, he looks at it and says, I would like this, and sticks his cane into it and flips it up and takes it home with him. Rusty tin can is your heart. Yeah, I love it. I love all of that. Because it, it's evidence, you know, so the whole thing, it's, yeah. Well, well, yeah, but, I mean, thinking about this application, like, okay, the righteous, the righteous is spared in the city, but that's not technically Abraham's prayer. Abraham's prayer is for everybody to be spared. Yeah. So you have also this application of, if you want to call Lot the elect, right? That being said, but then also pointing forward to the day when his offspring is the only one who is not spared so that everybody can be spared. Uh, and then the fact that Jesus connects that to, you know, it'll be better, it'll be more bearable on the day of, of judgment for Sodom. It's just, yeah, there's so much, oh, it's so touch on, thick. Like you never thought that, right? Genesis is like, ah, eh, it's pretty easy. No, it's not. E yeah, Howard. <clears throat> Branson, Missouri. No. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite of something. <laughs> yes, to Nineveh. Yeah, the opposite. And I think that's why Luther mentions that. He says the opposite is Jonah. Because he goes, he doesn't even want to. He doesn't want to pray for these people. He hates the Assyrians. Why would I don't want them to repent. He literally says... If I go there, then they're going to listen and they're going to repent. I don't want them to repent. I want them to be killed. By... So Jonah is like the anti-prophet. And... But Abraham is the righteous man whose prayer is powerful and effective. Okay, so to conclude the last minutes of Bible study, why didn't Abraham's prayer work? The whole city was destroyed. What do you mean it didn't work? seems to me that Abraham wants, Abraham does not want God to kill Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's going to do whatever he can, say whatever he can. But Sodom and Gomorrah is still destroyed. Similar to, yeah, his wife doesn't. That's her fault. Uh, she was a salty old gal. The topology of Jesus does the same thing. God doesn't answer his prayer at first. He prays that there be another way, but then says, not my will, but your will, right? So I think there's, there's a similarity there, a typological similarity between the, you know, with Abraham and Jesus saying, it's not my will, but your will be done, but that doesn't stop the fervent prayer, so apply that to yourself. Pray, 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 pray. Uh, I think I told this story one time in a sermon. Like, you know, I met somebody who was like, uh, her daughter uh, got cancer and tragically passed away. And she's like, I prayed for harder for that than I mean, you know, she's bragging about her prayer life. And she died anyway. So that told me that nobody was listening. And I'm like, well, you didn't have much of a faith to begin with. Like, you didn't understand what you were talking about. You didn't know what you were doing. You just, you know, you're like a drowning man trying to grab onto a floating board and then uh, have the audacity to tell me that because God's will is not what you wanted it to be, prayer doesn't work. You ever prayed for a loved one who's been dying, that he be healed, and he doesn't? What does that say about God? He knows better than you do. That's what it means. Uh, and your reflection is then, your relationship to him, your prayers then, turn into cries for comfort and for healing. Uh, you, O oh Lord, your ways
ways are not our ways. Uh, Job says, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. I've uttered things too beautiful for me to understand. Whenever you approach the throne of God asking, why didn't you answer my question? He is not obligated to tell you. Like, a, like an earthly father who tells his 12-year-old uh, after she asks why not nine times in a row, I literally told her, I have told her a few times, I am not obligated to explain myself to you. See, just like that is, you know, <laughs> fine. God, our Heavenly Father, is the same, right? Only um, think of it as an act of mercy because there are things that he knows that would literally explode your brain. You, you, cannot, you cannot contain the knowledge that God would have to give you. Even gazing upon his glory was too much. for the, Gazing upon the glory of Moses who met with him was too much for the Israelites. You think you want to know God's plan? Your brain will explode like the guys at the end of Indiana Jones. No, you don't. You don't want to know. You can't unknow that stuff. You can't unsee that stuff. So let God be God and every man a liar. Though that's what the Apostle Paul says. Though every man a liar, not let every man be a liar. Um, anyway, so in final conclusion, I have like four conclusions. I'm glad we studied the Bible this week. <laughs> uh, this is your takeaway from the story. Uh, from the story of Abraham. It's about the character of God. God will kill the unrighteous. He will spare the righteous. And why does he spare the righteous? He has made you righteous because you used to be unrighteous by sacrificing his righteous, Jesus Christ. Right? It's the same old story every week, but somehow it's still different, isn't it? Right. So let's pray for each other. Um, in the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you always. Amen. Ahem. <clears throat>One more thing, I've had some people ask me about this. The installation of the new principal will be at the 1030 service, but it will be at, right at the beginning. I've had people ask me about that who uh, probably have never gone to a 1030 church service a day in their life. <laughs> I gotta go to eight o'clock. If you go to 1030, your whole day is shot. Right? I know how it goes. <laughs>